This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The California road trip is over, and we're about to start some playoff hockey, something that we haven't said a lot of in this history of the Flames recently. And as usual, I'm Dan Stevenson, alongside my co-host, Matt DeBorg. Matt, um, but without getting into things too much, we saw the Flames take on Anaheim, L.A., and San Jose this past week. And looking at that game alone, what do you think of our chances against the Anaheim Ducks in the playoffs? Well, it's going to be a tough series. And Calgary hasn't fared too well against Anaheim over the last 27 games against the Ducks. The Flames have only won six times. Although in the last two meetings this past week and a bit, they've they could have won each of the games. It's just they got in their own way a bit in each case and ended up surrendering the two points. And that happens. Calgary does in the Honda Center. They always seem to find a way to lose. Like I thought they were the better team for the first half of the game, but still found a way to lose it and it is what it is and well let's break down that Honda Center game um I think the most notable piece of this is Johnson was in net Johnson made one save and ended up hurting himself and he was out for the rest of the game so talk about a Honda Center curse losing your goalie after the first save yeah it looked like he tweaked his knee which if it's a typical knee sprain that's usually a four to six week thing just basing it off of all the other goaltenders that we've seen that have had that particular injury whether it is that or not who knows the flames haven't really said much of anything in that regard but it's not like anybody was expecting johnson to make too many starts in the postseason anyway looking at this game i was really excited in the first period i don't know about you i thought it was a really good road period i don't want to say textbook road period but a really good period of road hockey the Flames spent most of the first 20 minutes deep in the duck zone. They had some quality penalty kill time. I thought that first period, if you look at that period as the start to this game, I was expecting the Flames to have taken the win after that one. Oh, so was I. And if the Flames and were playing... And they were Yeah, if they were playing in any other building other than Anaheim, they probably would have ended up finding that two points at the end of the night. But for whatever reason... It seems like that curse just gets in their head, and it's just so stupid. And like, uh, well, we've been going on this for thirteen years now, and it just doesn't make much sense. But like, even the Anaheim Duck fans at the end of the game were chanting, "You can't win here." So, you know, it's just really dumb. And like, the Flames have cycled through several complete different changes to their organization and yet still the results end up being the same yeah and you know coming into the second period up by one again i thought okay the flames might be able to do this and i thought the second period was their strongest period there's a lot to like in this period the patrick eves goal okay so it evened things up but i thought the way the flames are playing they'll get it back that second ducks goal the bx goal you can't really fault the flames for and if anything, I thought that one should have made them a lot hungrier to get back in and tie it back up. Um, but uh, again, I thought for this 20-minute segment, the Flames played the better game. Yeah, and then in the third period, they just gooned it up to send messages. and The whole thing went off the rails in that last 20, and that's why the Flames ended up losing this one. Yeah, because it was less about the actual game because i i think the flames didn't really care at that point it was just okay if we're gonna play you we're gonna make sure that you're not gonna be too happy with us <laughs> so it it's sort of like that la kings game it in calgary about 10 12 days ago uh where they got in their own way just because they were wanting to send messages and got off their game entirely in that third period and I mean, just looking at the penalties in this in this third period. In one period, we had 
Mark Giordano fighting against Josh Manson. Josh Manson fighting against Mark Giordano. Michael Furland roughing against Corbanian Holzer. Michael Furland again rough, or roughing against Corbanian Holzer. Corbanian Holzer roughing against Michael Furland. Sean Monahan roughing against Kessler. Kessler roughing against Monahan. Michael Furland misconduct. Corey Perry roughing against Derek England. Derek England roughing against Corey Perry. Like it just. It was always two guys dancing. Uh, we had Mar Mark Matt Bartkowski fighting against Corbanian Holzer. Backlund getting a cross check. Like there's just a mess of penalties there, especially all clumped right together at that 1659 mark. There was a ton of penalties, and you know I was trying to count how many ducks we could fit in the penalty box at one point. Oh, I know the pictures from that game were quite amusing. And two years ago, the Flames had a similar game against Anaheim at the end of the season, where it was the same kind of message sending and. Obviously, that didn't go too well for Calgary when they met them in the second round. So, what I'm trying to figure out though is how did Gio end up with more penalty minutes than Kessler? Because the refs were interesting. Like, the Weidman effect? It, well, not really. It just like it. You saw Furland be, get it being the third guy in and getting a penalty, the extra minor, which is fair. But then one of the Ducks players was the third man in a few minutes later, and we got the extra penalty again. And it's like, uh, what? So, and you saw the coach being visibly upset. <laughs> on well, as that. you should have like you, you should call it like, okay, this happened to us, so that should happen to them. But it didn't, and it is what it is. Not not surprisingly, the NHL rescinded uh, Barkowski's instigator penalty afterwards and removed the one-game suspension to the coach. After this game, I thought, okay, if these two teams end up playing in the playoffs, they've got it all out. It'll still be a lot of tension, but they've you know they've got this out of their system, and I'm not convinced they do. But it was really like you said, there's always the Flames always find a way to lose in the Honda Center. And this one, if they were just kept playing hockey the way they did the first two periods, I think they would have won this. But it turned into like WrestleMania in the third period, and we we just took our eyes off the prize. Yeah. Uh, and and now the Ducks have won for the 25th straight time against the Flames in their own barn, which I believe is an NHL record. It, it is, and. Now the Flames have to go for the longest consecutive streak without a win, which uh, Pittsburgh holds at 42 straight losses and or ties against the Philadelphia Flyers in the 70s and 80s. They had one lengthy streak, they tied a game, and then they had another lengthy streak of futility, which was the NHL record for longest consecutive losing streak prior to Calgary taking it, so... 17 more games to go, so, what, that's two, three games a year, so maybe by 2024, the Flames might get a win. <laughs> that, that'll that be, you know, by, by that point, either we'll have a Stanley Cup or we'll be back doing a rebuild. Yeah, pretty much. Um, interesting note in this game, after Johnson went down and Elliot joined the game, the Flames dressed their goaltending coach, Jordan Siglett, as the emergency backup goaltender. So he wasn't on the bench, but he was ready to go should they have needed that. So just kind of an interesting note there. That's one of the, I guess, the benefits of having a goaltender, a former NHL guy as your goalie coach. And I was thinking back when I heard that, do you remember a couple of years ago we had some goaltending problems when McLennan was our goalie coach? But they weren't able to dress him because he was still suspended. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. It was a long time ago, though. Yeah, it was. But that's that's what I remembered when I heard this. So, um, And after that game, it became official that the Flames would start the playoffs on the road in a wild card spot. We didn't know exactly who we'd be playing at that point. Um, but it turns out, as we know now, to be Anaheim. And so I think, you know, a good preview of what might be to come there. I don't know if there's anything else to say about that game besides great first 40, and then we just let it all fall apart. Yep. I think the same story can almost be said for the L.A. game. Um, I thought that later in this game, the Flames let it fall, fall apart. But the most notable thing in this game was uh, Calgary Flames goaltender we've been wanting to see for a while finally get his NHL debut. John Gillies made 27 saves in his debut as the Flames scored three unanswered goals in the second period to a 4-1 win. 
This one to me, I think, again, the Flames let themselves get into some of the 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 brawling as opposed to hockey, but they managed to win this one. Yeah. Well, it was the point guard matchup between the pipes with Gilly sit coming in at six six and Ben Bishop being six foot seven. Just the odd uh I think that may be the first time Gilly's ever been in net against a goalie that was actually taller than he is. Could be. And if the goalies would have gotten into a fight in this one, they couldn't have said pick on someone your own size. True. Sure. Um, Flame started the scoring in this one with Sam Bennett, which I thought, you know, was a pretty good power play goal from Bennett. Um, good way to start the scoring. I felt that right there, I started CLA coming apart. And and then Weidman got a goal. Freddie Hamilton got a goal. Chase on got a goal. So I thought it's weird that in a game, you know, that really by this point was insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Weidman and Hamilton both get goals. Two guys who also at this point have been pretty insignificant. Yeah, I don't think I would have ever expected to see Dennis Weidman scoring on a breakaway. It's like, um, what? <laughs> well, not just scoring on a breakaway, but scoring a game winner. Yeah, true. Which, you know, uh, good for him. It, hopefully he continues to play well into if he actually dresses in the playoffs and hopefully he can get a contract next year somewhere. So, it you know, it was nice to see. And just like it was nice to see some of the depth guys on the Flames getting some points for a change, like Chason and Freddie Hamilton. Well, and if so you're I'm, looking... I'm kind of disappointed, though, uh, with Sportsnet after the game. They really should have had Dougie Hamilton's pitcher on the three stars to make up for earlier in the year when they reversed it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think the producers are probably remembering that. Um, but yeah, I mean, good to see some, you know, some flames who are either new or don't play a lot of games get points. Um, the Weidman goal is fifth of the year was assisted by Furlan in England. The Hamilton goal assisted by Brower and Lazar and the chase on goal by Brody and Versteeg. So, um, you know, I see Lazar get a point. I see Hamilton get a point. I thought that this was probably the best Curtis Lazar game we've seen yet. Um, you know, he still looks like a bottom six guy to me, but he's looking more comfortable. But the real question, Matt, is uh, John Gillies, who's the fifth Calgary goalie to win his first NHL game. What do you think of his play in this one? You could see that he had some nerves. Uh, there was some rebounds that he kicked out that I don't think he would have otherwise. But all in all, he looked like an NHL goaltender. I didn't see anything particularly bad in his game. I don't think that like he would be a starter right away, but... The Flames, if they wanted to next year, say, re-sign Elliott or acquire some other similar starter and have Gillies play 30 games, I think that'd be perfectly viable with how he played. I thought for his first NHL game and for a guy who struggled a little bit the last two years in the AHL, I thought he looked good. Now, I, he got a lot of help from L.A. in that because L.A. really shut down about midway through the second period and just stopped playing their game. So I think that they made Gillies look maybe better than he should have looked. But either way, I think it's a great confidence boost for the kid. Yep. And at least he gets to understand what it takes to be in the NHL. So as he does his work in the off season, he can get some more ideas on like what he, adjustments he needs to make. And you never know if uh, Johnson's out and if Elliott struggles, maybe Gillies gets a game in the playoffs. Could it happen. Could. Well, and, and that brings us to the next question, which is which of the two Calgary goalies that got their NHL debut this week do you start in the, or would you give a playoff start to if you needed Gillies. to? Gillies. You think so? Yeah. You go with the larger goaltender. Uh, like, Riddich has had a good season, but Gillies, he covers more than that, and he looks. Honestly, he looked better than Riddich in their action this week, so I'd give it to him and see. Plus, Gillies is more likely the goalie of the future, where Riddich is still quite a bit of a question mark. Yeah, I don't know. Um, well, let's talk about the last game with Riddich. The Calgary Flames finished their season on the road in San Jose, taking on the San Jose Sharks. The Sharks won and got the third spot in the Pacific Division with a 3-1 to win. 
And the only goal the Flames managed to score is from Curtis Lazar, his first goal as a Flame. Um, and I believe, no, not his first goal of the season, but his first goal as a Flame, I believe. No, it was his first goal was of the season. Okay. Yeah. So good to see that. Um, this game, as as we mentioned, the Flames tried yet another goaltender. It's nice being on a California swing. You can easily bring in young goaltenders. And the net was split. Uh, David David Riddich came in, played 20 minutes, and Brian Elliott cleaned up with the other 40 minutes. So overall, Riddich had the higher save percentage. But I, I agree with you in principle that, yeah, Elliott is the goalie of the future, but I think David Riddich is the guy who – if either one of them is going to get called up to backup next year, it's probably Riddich. But yeah, I think you're right. If you're looking for a playoff starter, it'd be Gillies. I didn't think Riddich looked all that bad. I thought that no, they both look good. It's just I thought Gillies performed better. Yeah, and I mean Aaron Aaron Dell was on the other side, so you know it's backup against backup. Um, but I think if you would have put Riddich in the LA game, he would have looked just as good. Like I think this was a tough game to start. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things that it it's hard to split hairs on a small sample size. We're talking about 80 minutes of hockey between the two of them. Like it, it, you'd need to see like 10 or 15 games from each to get like an actual idea of what they have. So, but you know, it, for how each of them played, like not, neither one of them embarrassed themselves. Like, even the goal that Riddich allowed, it was a double deflection in, right in front of him, and that either hits you or goes in, and unfortunately for him, it went in. And he made a few good saves. Gillies made a, quite a few good saves in the L.A. game. And Rasmus Anderson, I thought, who also made his NHL debut, I thought he struggled quite a bit in the Sharks game, but not as bad as he could have been. Like, he... Didn't look out of place, just still adapting to the speed of the game. Yeah, Giordano and England were out, and Weidman and Anderson slotted into their spots. Um, Rasmus played about the way I expected Rasmus to play. He was not, uh, you know, him and Shillington are kind of the two guys that are seen as the future on the blue line here. I still think Shillington right now is the better of the two players. I think Shillington has the better... I don't want to say physical because I don't think his body is better, but I think he's in better condition. I think he's better conditioned. And I think he will be the one that gets the first full-time call. But, you know, good for them to see Raz and what he's got. And he played about the way I expect him to. He got uh, 18 minutes and 33 seconds on ice, a uh, minute and 52 on the power play, and one second shorthanded. Yeah, and like you could see that like this guy will be an NHL player. Yeah, I it, think he's a, and I don't think he's a project. He's just not ready quite yet. Yeah, it's sort of like when TJ Brody got his first recall. It, he, you could see that there was talent there. It's just he was raw, and I'm expecting Anderson and Shillington will be duking it out for the five six spots next year, and we'll see. Uh, it's up to them to on who will take those spots, and. We'll see, but you can see that there's a legitimate NHL player there, just very inexperienced, which is not surprising when each of them is 20 years old. Yeah, and that's the thing I was going to point out is, you know what, he's 20. He's still got some development time, um, I think. And, and this is also his first, I mean, he, he turned pro this year. I think that Raz is a guy who could use a little bit more time at the HL level, even for some seasoning, it wouldn't hurt him. I don't want to rush him up, but I think that there's, yeah, there's a lot of good talent there. And whether it's AHL or NHL next year, this we got a lot to look forward to with this kid. Yep. I know. I I see a little bit of like a Nicholas Chalmerson type player in Anderson. And like if he, over the next handful of years, can emerge as that quality 3-4 guy, that would be huge for the Flames' success down the road, especially as like the roster begins to transition over and some contracts get moved and all that. And that's also the reason I don't want to rush them is I don't think we need them even next year. I think if we need to, we could always go out and fill the five, six role externally or with a guy like Kulak. Um, I think that this guy's worth waiting on if we need to. Yeah. Like you could always find like a veteran number five 
like bring Stone back and like England or an England type guy for the number five spot, have Kulak and uh, Barkowski fight for the number six with Shillington and Anderson and whoever's the best gets the spot. Like if Anderson comes in next year and just blows the doors off of things, well, you give him the spot. But, you know, there's just flexibility there and we'll see. But it's encouraging that, like, he didn't embarrass himself where, like, a Tim Ramholt situation where a couple shifts and that's it for your NHL career. <laughs> yeah, and he's, I mean, the biggest question about Rasmus Anderson at rookie camp when you and I were there covering the rookie camp it was his conditioning. And, you know, he was called out, I think, even by Treliving saying that. So good for him for fixing that this year. You know, he's really acted like a pro. But, yeah, I don't see a need to rush this kid. You know, sometimes it's like, okay, we need a defenseman now. I don't think Anderson it, plays yeah. enough of a role next year where you say this guy needs to come in. It's not like we're going to stick him yeah, on the second the only, pairing. Yeah, the only reason why you would, like, he would make the team next year is if he just forces his way onto the team. In which case, you're not really going to complain, because if he's doing enough where he takes a spot, well, then obviously he's ready, and you just let him rip. But, yeah, but I think if if it's, uh, you know, if he's the same Rasmus Anderson or even slightly better than what we saw last year, I don't think I'd force him onto this team no, as a 5'6 guy. neither would I. Nor would I with Shillington. Same. I think, you know, a Kulak or, you know, Culkin somebody with or, a little Somebody with a little bit more experience and pedigree who's not as likely to be accident prone out there. Yeah, or or even a guy like a Yoki Paka, you know, someone with a few years yeah, NHL experience. Just dependable. Who, yeah. Yeah, who, you know, can play can play a few games. Like Freddie Hamilton this year, I think is pretty amazing because no matter how many games he plays, he always looks about the same out there. He doesn't, you know, come in and have a really bad game or a really good game. If you can find that guy in your five six defenseman, a guy who doesn't play maybe a lot or I guess let's say you're six seven, but every time he does, you get the same game out of him. Yeah. Well, Matt, now that we finished the season, why don't we look back at some of the predictions you and I made before the season and see how we did? Okay. Um, we each made four predictions at the beginning of the year. We first predicted who we thought would be the first guy to lose his spot in the lineup. If you remember last year, we both thought it'd be Mason Raymond, and this year we had deferring opinions. I had thought that going into the season, Matt Stajan would be the first guy to lose his spot. And I have to give Stage credit. He's probably had the best year I think he's had as a flame this year. Or close. Like, I think he was good right like when we first got him and then he went down a bit. But I, I, think he was good the... I think he was good offensively that year. But I think that, you know, he's always been looked at as a defensive forward. And I think this year yeah. he, he learned his role and he had the best role playing year. Yeah, I agree. It, it, easily in the last four years, this was his best. Um, I don't think it'll be good enough to earn him another contract after this one with the Flames, but I think it, you know, it He'll was nice to see. He'll have a job see. somewhere. Like, th that type of player that is always used for a anywhere. Like, he he's a player that will probably play until he's 37, 38, just because of how useful he is. I still think he ends up in Vegas this offseason. Wouldn't be shocked. You had predicted the first guy to lose his spot would be Dennis Weidman. And this guy's like, you know, you remember that kid song, The Cat Came Back the Very Next Day? Yeah. We thought he was a goner. That's like Weidman. I mean, we thought we got rid of him at the deadline. We thought we'd never see him again after Stone comes in. And now we're still seeing him play. Yeah, well, he has lost his spot. He's just now the number seven. So, and when you've had injuries and. But I think you'd thought that he might players. even get banished to the AHL. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that didn't happen, so it is what it is. We then both predicted the first guy we thought would get a call up both for forwards and for defensemen. I had predicted the first forward to be called up, same as you, as Mark Jankowski, and we deferred on defense. I thought Watherspoon would get called up because he's kind of old faithful at this point, and he thought it would be Shillington. Yeah. I'd have to go back and look. Um, Watherspoon Jan did get... Yeah. You were right with Watherspoon and uh, Jankowski. We were both correct. Yeah, I wasn't sure if Janko was the first forward called up. Um, and technically, on the last point, the first guy to lose his spot was Nick Grossman. True. If you think about it, he came in, played, what, three games and got banished? Yeah. 
Um, so technically, I mean, he made the opening day roster. He was the, fir- the first guy to lose it. You and I also predicted the Western Conference finish, where we thought the Flames would finish in the West. I had suggested that we'd probably have it. We'd probably be either sixth or seventh in the Western Conference. And you thought we'd be first in the Pacific Division with a 100-point team, and you thought we'd be fourth or fifth in the conference. So both of us predicted playoffs. Um, I know we started wavering, you know, at the beginning of the season of, well, this team doesn't look like a playoff team, but we'll give a we'll give both of us credit for a playoff uh, yeah. well, expectation. I didn't anticipate the Flames having such a bad start to the season, but I don't think too many people did like that was really bad in the until the middle of november yeah it was and and, you know that definitely changed some things yeah so like if they had played like from prior to that or like from like november on throughout the season the flames probably would have had 104 or 105 points but that happened so yeah, they good on them for rebounding at least, and they played well enough that they actually secured a playoff spot. Which, for being as bad as they were, I think at one point we were thirtieth in the middle of November to be one of the top teams in the NHL and make the postseason. Hey, that's awesome. So, you know. It, it could have very well been that the Flames could have been where, say, Winnipeg or Dallas is in the standings if they didn't have such a strong finish. Yeah, and that's the thing, is I think the finish was important for this team. Um, just finishing wrapping up our predictions, the last one I made that was optimistic was I thought that Lance Bomo was going to have a bounce-back season and get 20 or more points. And that did not happen. That did not. And I have to look up exactly how many he got here. But, I mean, we paid Boma. If you look at his contract, he got paid based on one good season. And I remember when he signed that contract, you and I had wondered, can he do it again? And we hoped he could. But he hasn't shown that he could do that again. Um, This year, he had a total of how many points do you think, Matt? I'd say 12, 13. That would be generous. He had three goals and four assists for seven total points. Yeah, he ends the season with a minus two and his plus minus and thirty five penalty minutes. Yeah, rather unremarkable season, and yeah, who knows? Might end up being his last season in Calgary, one well, way or the other. And and you've talked about this before. I think that a guy like Hathaway, um, you know, could definitely end up potentially supplanting him just because he'll be cheaper. Yeah. Well, you were talking a little bit about some of the story of the Flames early in the season, and I think that there's definitely, this has been an interesting season for Flame fans. You and I came in very optimistic. We looked at the team on paper. We both said the biggest thing they were missing was a top-line right winger, which looked like Chase on going into the year. Um, Still missing that, but not much we, you can do about we it. We also, you know, at the time at Hunter and Carrick penciled into the lineup. I'm just looking at the lineup that I'd penciled in here in week one. And this season was rocky for Flames fans. I mean, it's a heck of a story, but it was kind of rocky. And if you if you look at the season in general for the NHL, I think poor goaltending seemed to be the story for a lot of teams this year. A lot of teams, including Calgary, didn't get the goaltending they wanted all year. Oh, for sure. And some teams benefited from surprise goaltending, like Los Angeles with Peter Budai, who kind of came out of nowhere and posted Jonathan Quick type numbers but a lot of teams just had disastrous goaltending like if you look at Winnipeg uh, Hutchison and um, Hellebuck should have been a good enough tandem that the Jets should have made the postseason and yet you know that, that not much you can do when both the guys perform very inconsistently and well they ended up using three goalies in Winnipeg this year yeah uh, Andre Pavlik, I do believe, played some as well. But even like Dallas, their goaltending failed them significantly, although part of that was uh, losing half of their defense core. But, you know, just it, it has been a weird season for bad goaltending. 
And, and I would say, you know, on, on all those teams, too, I think another team that really struggled was St. Louis. Yeah, uh, until Jake Allen figured things out about halfway through. He was terrible up until that point, but he's I, been I think good Jake since Allen's then. used to being a 1B, and I don't know that he was quite ready to take over the 1A role. And, you know, Carter Hutton is a very different backup than they're used to there. He's not, you know, your Brian Elliott. So I think it was a bit of an adjustment there for Allen. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I, you know, we weren't the only team that had a poor start to the goaltending. But let's, you know... Uh, Overall, though, Matt, if we look at this year's tandem of Johnson Elliott and we look at past year's tandems of um, Ramo and Hiller, I think no doubt this is by far a superior goaltending pair. Yeah, if you rank the goalies from Kipper forward uh, after he retired, like uh, number one and number two are Elliott and Johnson. Like it, it's no contest. Every other goaltender that has played has been clearly inferior to those two guys. You know, and we've said in the past that on paper, a Ramo Hiller pairing was probably, and I said this for a few years, on paper, the strongest pairing in the league. Not necessarily the best goalie, but the strongest one, too. And I think we saw the Flames do the same thing this year, bringing in two guys who are very experienced. And, you know, we saw Johnson go on a run. We saw Elliott go on a run. I don't think that the goaltending is was ever really bad here, but I don't think it was where it needed to be to be a playoff team. Yeah. It struggled more in the beginning of the season, and then it got better to the point where they were playing as they should be. And both guys are top end goalies, but not like top tier goalies. And Elliot does have that ability to go up into the be a top five goalie. It's just. Can he continue to do that into the postseason? We'll see. The The other big change that we saw, and I think a lot of the reason why, as you were mentioning, we saw maybe some struggles at the beginning of the season, was the coaching change. We saw that the Flames brought in Glenn Gulletson. They fired Bob Hartley at the end of the year, last year. So the big question is, are the Flames better off under Gulletson? They made the playoffs under Hartley. They made the playoffs under Gulletson. To me, there's no question there. I think Gullitson is the better coach for this team. He's got the team into the playoffs in a better way, and they're playing better hockey. But do you, would you argue with that? No, not at all. And the Flames defensively are a lot more sound than they were under Hartley. It was an adventure, <laughs> to say the least, under Hartley. And like it the flames aren't as good defensively as i would like them to be but the flames also have two or three defensemen that i wouldn't have on the team under normal circumstances as well which i I think we saw this team perform as well as we can ask it to based on the roster that's on the ice exactly and like there are some upgrades like i would get a i'd upgrade the four five six if possible and get a ringer for a, a top six right winger to put with Gaudreau and Monaghan. Furlan's doing okay, but I think you need more of a sure bet than that. And it would allow Furlan to play with Bennett, which I think would be a better fit as well in terms of play style. But that's another day. But uh, no, I thought that... Uh, the poor start was a confluence of Gaudreau and Monaghan not having any training camp a new system and the fact that the flames were pretty much playing all elite teams uh, right through till the end of november or the middle of november and like you're trying to figure things out and you're playing teams like chicago repeatedly and it's like uh even at the best of times there's no room for error and yet <laughs> you, you don't have things together yet and that was the reason why the Flames were 30th at one point. Yeah, I think it was that. I think it was, you know, getting a new play style in. I mean, as expected, eventually, once they got together, we saw the Flames play a more structured puck possession style game. I also think that it was about building chemistry this year. We saw some lines form that we really hadn't in the past. We saw guys getting rewarded for that. And unlike Hartley, I think that Gullitson, for the most part, was less married to his choices and his lines. You know, we saw the 3M line emerge. We saw 
the breakup of Monahan and Goudreau. We saw the breakup of Giordano and Brody. And I think good things came out of that. But I think that with all that change in the lineup, it also takes longer to, you know, to form that new chemistry. I agree. And it took about half the season for Brody to get his stuff together, learning how to play on the left side. Well, I and think he's partly been in... playing on the left side and partly who he was playing with. True. When you're playing with Dennis Weidman, it's a little tough. But I mean, I, I think that if you would have had Stone there from the beginning, you would have seen a different Brody in the first half. Probably. So, you know, but I mean, if we look at it, player usage was a big one. Um, Alex Chason got a lot of chances at the beginning of the season. Maybe more than he should have, but I mean, it all it all ended up correcting itself, right? Chason found his rightful place in the lineup. We saw the emergence of that 3M line, and even a guy like Michael Furland eventually made his way to the first line. And when Sun was working, the coach didn't seem to change it. And I think we saw that in the past sometimes with Hartley, where Sun would work, and then it's like he got bored and he'd just change it. Um, but I think that we experimented more at the beginning until we found the right stuff, and then we, we stayed with it. We got locked in. Yeah, it's just like Kachuk was with Bennett and Brower to start the year, and like it worked fairly well, but... Kachuk started struggling on that line, threw him on with Backlund and Froelich to get for Kachuk to play a little better, and he ended up improving significantly on that line and made that line one of the best lines in the entire NHL. So to the point where I think that even next year, I, I honestly do not see Kachuk moving off of that line, and... I think that's a good threesome for at least a couple of seasons and see how it goes. But yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see, especially moving forward, any adjustments that are made to make the lineup a little better and more fleshed out properly. And I think we were able to hide some of our weaknesses because we did find good chemistry. I mean, yes, it's a weakness, don't get me wrong, but I think that the fact the first line doesn't have a bona fide right winger on it isn't as apparent as it was earlier in the year when we saw Chase on and Brower and other guys play there with Furland on it just because he he clicks so well with these guys. Yeah, I agree. You know, I'm not saying he'll stay there forever, but he just we got the chemistry, we found the right piece, and we kept it there. And it's given us, you know, a first line that's obviously playoff worthy because it got us into the playoffs. Yep. Yeah, because like if you're looking at the roster, like the Flames definitely need a top six winger somewhere along the line. It's just figuring out how to do so, but that's a draft slash free agency thing. Yeah, we'll talk about that as we get closer to those to those two dates. I think another thing that was clicking this year is the special teams. There were fans after the first game, the 10th game, and even the 20th games calling for Gullitson's head, and maybe even more loudly was fans calling for Dave Cameron's head, saying what a crappy special teams coach he was. He was, you know, doing bad things for us, but you couldn't have got any worse special teams than last year. And well, I think the Flames were 30th and 29th in the power play and penalty kill at one point at the same time. and Yeah, but like, the that whole was team wasn't the, clicking to that point. Yeah, and... Credit to them, they started working on it, like, all practice, every practice, until things got better. And since then, the Flames have been in the top three in each category, which is a major reason why the Flames are in the postseason. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we have the best, you know, special teams of the whole league, but I think that... Our special team's improvement is definitely one of the things that got us into the playoffs. I don't think we'd be where we are if we were still in special teams. Actually, I'm going to argue with you. Since that point, I think the Flames have had the best special teams in the entire NHL. Because since that, we're, we're in the top three in each category since then. I think we're 10th and 11th overall. I can't remember exactly, but it's close to that. Which going from 30th after the first month and a half to being close to the top 10 is a massive improvement. It is. And I think that, you know, again, we might be getting some, we might be getting better, better performance than we should be on that special teams unit. I'd be curious to see how the same guys in the same systems would play over an 82 game season where they're all clicking. Yeah. But, um, it, 
the good thing is is that the F flames power play and penalty kill have been really good of late which as we carry on into the postseason that is very important for sure any other kind of keys of what you thought was either a positive or negative looking back at this season? What's going to define this season for us going forward? I think that uh, this season, to me, is the first step towards building a contending team. And we've got pieces that you can obviously see that are doing good. And, like, there are obvious pieces that are not and will have to be adjusted. But, on the whole, the team is looking like it's building towards being one of those Chicago-type teams where we're going to be at the top or near the top of the standings year in, year out, like Anaheim has been in recent history. And it's just a matter of getting through the playoffs this year and into the offseason see what adjustments can be made to the roster how the expansion draft will go all those kind of things to see exactly what adjustments can be made and see which of the prospects emerges and all that to see exactly where the team is but i i just view this season as a huge massive step in the right direction it's just having to wait and see what the next steps are going to be as the flames build towards being a contender for me i think when i look at this this is i don't want to call it the payoff but this is the season that it's obviously evident the rebuild is working yeah you know we've been through some dark times lately even when we made the playoffs a couple of years ago i mean we all knew it wasn't a playoff team we got lucky in a lot of ways to get in there, but, and I'm not saying this, this is a playoff team, but we're starting to see this rebuild working. We're starting to see the pieces clicking and the results of that coming. I still think we're a couple of years away, but definitely a move in the right direction. Yeah. Like the flames will have challenges that they have to overcome. And one of them is coming up next week, winning in the Honda center. <laughs> yeah but uh, you know i mean even outside of that if we look at the roster you know i think uh kachuk's rookie season is going to be something we're all going to look back at and remember i think getting better performances out of guys like versteeg um you know stage in finally finding that role for fro leak i think that just the the man management is going to be something that we're going to look at this year and say you know what our coach maybe didn't have the best roster maybe didn't have the roster he wanted but i think Outside he, of a few guys, he was able to get the best out of every player on this team. Yeah, I agree. You know, I mean, even Sam Bennett, who's still trying to figure out who he is, I think, you know, eventually figured that out. Troy Brower's maybe an exception there, but we all knew that going into this that well, he might Troy be. Well, Troy Brower always, like, it, whenever he's changed teams, he his production has dropped, and then the next year it rebounds. So... I think part of it was his hand injury because he was performing basically at his pace normally, which is around 35 to 45 points, up until he hurt his hand on when Versteeg shot the puck into it. And like his production from that point through till like that Washington road trip just died. And like he only had four points in that whole huge stretch from like the December right through till February. So or March, I should say. Um, so it, it's ever since then, Brower has been his usual self. So we'll see, especially cause he's more of a playoff type performer. If he continues to play as he has, as he has in the recent weeks, or if we're going to get that, you know, coming off the injury type Brower, which is obviously not nearly as good. I also think that this is a year when we look back at it that's going to be almost the year of the defenseman. I think a lot of the stories this year come on the blue line. We saw Mar Matt Bartkowski come in, play decent enough hockey to stick around. We saw the splitting up of Giordano and Brody that lasted. I mean, we saw you know Johnny and Monty get broken up. I was always a proponent of putting them back together, and that's what we did, and they've been successful. But I think really that emergence of two top defensive pairings i think the emergence of of dougie hamilton as an elite not necessarily in the league but elite on this team that number two guy and really the you know the chance for michael stone to come in and 
make a better name for himself than he had elsewhere. I think that when I look back at this season, it's going to be a lot of the stories on defense. Yeah. Like, I have no argument there. The team has, the defensive core has performed better than it did last year, obviously. And now it's just a matter of seeing how far these guys can go as a group and then what adjustments can be made in the off season to further enhance the team. And I think too, that the, you know, for a while Giordano has been that core focus of the blue line. And we know that Gio is getting older and he's not going to be that number one guy forever. And for me, when I look at this blue line, I'm, more confident this year than I have before that, okay, we can do this without him in a few years. You know, last year was like we had Giordano and Brody and hopefully Hamilton will get his stuff together. And I'm not saying that Giro is going to be retiring at the end of the year or anything, but as I look at this current crop of guys who will be back on the blue line, plus our guys like Anderson, uh, you know, Shillington, maybe Kulak. Exactly. I feel that the blue line is in better shape than it has been for a while. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked this year at the draft if the Flames don't add another defenseman just based on where the Flames are picking. And the well, that's it. They don't have a lot of picks. Yeah, well, especially in the first round, it's a lot of short players around where we're doing and bigger physical defensemen, so I'm expecting more of the bigger physical defensemen. But we'll anyhow... Talk- We'll talk about this as we get close to the draft, but I wouldn't be surprised if we move our first-round pick and try to acquire a roster player. Neither would I. I don't think that this is a year where we need a first-round pick. Honestly, if it was up to me, I would not. Ha- I would have done exactly what Trey Living did, which was trade the second and the third, and I would trade the first because the player that you're going to get is likely going to be better than the prospect that you'd get. I so, don't think there's as much value for first until after the expansion draft. No. So, And that could be very well how the Flames get their first-line right winger. We'll see. Yep. Because I don't think anybody would have predicted the Flames getting Dougie Hamilton two years ago. No, and that's it. If we can pull off another Hamilton-like deal, I'll be a very happy man. Yeah, same here. Because then, you know, we'll be one of the teams to beat, period. So, we'll see. Well, the other thing that makes me a very happy man is the fact that we have playoff hockey coming up. And we take on the Anaheim Ducks in round one. The schedule's been announced. For those that don't know, we start the series in Anaheim, obviously, the first two games. The 13th of April is game one. The 15th of April is game two. Then the Flames will return to the Dome on the 17th and the 19th, so Easter Monday and the following Wednesday. Um, And then, if needed, it's Anaheim on the 21st, Calgary on the 23rd, and the 25th in Anaheim. So... Matt, not a surprising opponent for us, but let's talk a little bit about this series. First off is, can the Flames win this series? Yes. It's just... Calgary can't get in their own way. And back two years ago when they made the playoffs, they lucked out in getting an opponent in the first round that they could bully. And like we saw with Boston when they played Vancouver in the Stanley Cup Finals, how they won was they just beat the crap out of Vancouver. And the Flames copied that playbook, and it worked. But then the Flames tried to do the exact same thing to Anaheim, and Anaheim's not a team that you can bully, and the Flames were easily dispatched in five games. And... You know, I think that's an interesting point, too. Two years ago or three years ago, that was the Flames' MO. The Flames were a truculent team where they were about the, you know, the heavy hitting. And this year, I don't feel that they are. And I think we're changing what that definition of Flames hockey is. Yeah. Well, they are, but they're more smart about it. Like, the... like if They can the, do it when they have to, but they're not going out there just throwing their weight around when games get away from them. Yeah. And, like, it, if, say, like, in the upcoming series if you see guys like Furland and all of them Kachuk just throwing the body around only just to throw the body around and not playing responsible then the Flames it'll be a five game series if that and like we saw in the LA game and in the third period of the most recent Anaheim game when the Flames get off of their game and try to 
take it to the opposition physically, they do stupid things and the other team wins. And Calgary, if they're going to be successful, like, I'm not saying not to hit. Like, believe me, I want to see Furland hitting anything that moves when it makes sense. Well, you have to against the Anaheim Ducks, too. Yeah. And, like, I want to see Kachuk and Boma and everybody finishing their checks. It's just... They can't take stupid penalties, one, because Anaheim's power play is very dangerous. When you have Getzlaff and Perry out, out there, like, you're screwed, pretty much. But... They need to almost piss Anaheim off by, like, being extremely physical and then just skate away from them. Like, when the whistle goes, don't screw around, don't throw punches, or get off, you know, like, it. it's different if you're, say, losing the game 4-1 to one in the last five minutes than, you know, send messages but but that's a good point too is one of the ways i think we're gonna win this is to have the man advantage as often as we can and if you can just walk away from it as hard as that can be you're gonna cause anaheim take penalties yeah and like, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna have that advantage of having one man on and hopefully one of their top guys not on yeah and we've seen that from kachuk for a good portion of the year where he'd goad the other teams into taking stupid penalties and he wouldn't go to the penalty box and the Flames would get a power play and either score or get some good chances. And the flame, that's how the Flames have to play is that disturber role of getting under the other guy's skin so they will punch you after the whistle or cross-check you in the inappropriate way or whatever and just walk away from it. Because that will frustrate the team, like especially in the Vancouver series, like, Furlan kept on Bieksa <laughs> throughout the series and he eventually snapped and started throwing punches at Furland in one of the games. I remember and, that. And he you could see like Furland got into his head and it threw him off cuz every second he was expecting Furland to hit him and he just it, it screwed with him. And that's what the Flames need to do be controlled with their aggression and just be the dirtbags that like all the NHL fans think of Calgary as do that and just be a pain in the ass. Well, and I think that's the big, for me, that's the big question is if we play hockey, if both teams can play hockey, even if it's physical hockey, I think the flames have a chance to win this one. If we let them get in our heads and it just turns into, you know, a big street fight and we're I'm, not going to win yeah. this. Like, if you're just going skill on skill, I actually think Calgary is the better team. It's just... The Flames tend to do stupid stuff at, from time to time, and that's part of inexperience. And, you know, that, that's what happened a couple years ago in that series against Anaheim. And they have to play their game. And if they're playing their game... They can beat anybody, and we've seen how they've played from the middle of November on. They've been one of the seven or eight best teams in the NHL. It's just, can they play without getting in their own way? Well, that's where I think game one is going to be important. Game one, I think, is going to establish how the Flames are perceived by their opponent. We can't necessarily go out there and just have a street fight, but I think we're going to have to fight back a little bit to show Anaheim that, you know what, we're willing to fight and we're willing to push back and we're willing to, you know, to do what it takes to hold our own. It doesn't just have to keep happening after that, but I think game one is really going to be us testing to see how much we can get away with and how much it's going to take Anaheim to back off. Yeah, and honestly, I think if the Flames win game one, they take the series. If they lose game one, they're done. And I, it's weird to put that much pressure on it. It's just that if they can get the Honda Center thing out of the storylines and prove to themselves that they can do it, then that'll give them more confidence. But if they, especially if they find a way to lose game one, like much like the last game against Anaheim. I think Anaheim fourth. is going to come into game one not necessarily wanting to outplay the Flames, but just wanting to frustrate the Flames. Yeah, and... And I think especially if we start playing... Like in the Anaheim game, we played the better first 40, and I think you'll see the same. I think the Flames will come in and play the better hockey game. Anaheim is going to try and bully us and 
take us out of our game, and that's going to be how they're going to try and win this series. It's just getting under into our heads. Yeah, and really, if they can piss the Flames off and where it becomes score settling, then yeah, Anaheim's going to win. It, like It's not going to be an easy series anyway, but Calgary can win. It's just that they have to play a perfect game. And so, what, so what's your prediction for how many games this series takes? It depends on what iteration of the Flames we see. If we see the, we're going to try and bully you when you're a team that can handle it, the Flames, I don't think, last more than five games. If the Flames play that frustrating physical game, but back it up with skill and finesse, I think the Flames could take it in six or seven. Yeah, I don't think it's an easy series either way. I think that, you know, this is going to be a hard-fought one. I think some of the keys to our success, I think that if you look at the four lines, I think the Flames have a better lineup depth up front. I agree. I think, that, I think we have four lines that are ready to go, and we can match almost any – well, not any line, but I think that we, we're we not as, as worried about the matchups as the Ducks are. And I think especially in the first couple games – because they're going to get last change, you're going to see them matching specific lines up. I think we, I don't want to roll our lines necessarily, but I think that we have much more flexibility in who goes against who. Yeah, I agree. Because um, like each of our li- first three lines can do damage, just like theirs can. So the Flames will just have to figure out how to best to adapt to each situation as it comes up. My worry or my, you know, example of where we may fall short is our third pairing. I think that England can do it. I'm not sure that Bartkowski is the right number six going to the playoffs, nor do I necessarily think that Weidman is. So I think if there's a place we may see this lineup fall short, it's going to be that third pairing, especially in Anaheim where we're probably going to try and pair up, you know, we're going to try and have them pair or they're going to try and pair less ideal matchups for us with that third pairing. Yeah. Like, realistically, I'm hoping that, like, uh, Hamilton Brody or Hamilton Geo play about 26, 27 minutes a night and Brody Stone play, like, 23, 24 minutes a night and, like, the third pairing gets, like, 8 to 10 minutes and just kind of shelter them, only putting them out periodically or, like, when the Flames are on the penalty kill because I know England plays there. Like, that's it, though. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, again, going forward, that's a hole that'll have to be fixed. It hasn't yet, but, you know, with where we are, that's the piece of the roster I'm worried that might fall apart. Yeah, that's the one Achilles heel that the Flames do have. But on the other end, Anaheim is going to be missing Cam Fowler for probably the first three or four games of the series, so that's a help. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just, I don't know, I think they have a stronger defensive core than we do if you look at it overall. Yeah. Um, the, and the Flames do come into this relatively healthy, which is nice. Yeah, only Chad Johnson, really. And he was not really expected to start anyway, so... No. So, Matt, um, looking at this team, looking at what we know from the past, we've got guys like... Um, we got guys like Johnny Goudros, Sean Monahan. Um, we've got you know younger guys like Lazar and even Freddie Hamilton. How many guys in this team do you think are going to be able to grow a legit playoff beard? Uh, probably half the lineup. It, pretty much like anybody who's over the age of twenty four plus. Uh, Dougie Hamilton, Brody uh, England. They've already got their started. Weidman's got his started. Yeah, so I think th- those guys will be good. Uh yeah, at least we're not Toronto where like a guy like Marner looks like he's 10 years old. So you That's know. true. Well, yeah. I don't know. Goudreau's not far behind. True. Well, let's go through this lineup quickly. And yes or no to playoff beards, all right? Sure, why not? Backland. I think he might attempt it, but it'll just be like that weird stash that he has in November. Uh, Bennett. He, he will. Uh, Boma. Definitely. Troy Brower. Definitely. He's already got it going. Alex Chason. Eh, probably not. I think Chason will be the guy on the team you see who's got the patchy beard that doesn't really come yeah. in and, and it looks terrible. Yeah. Uh, Furland? Definitely. Froleek? Yeah, he usually has a beard. He's so. already got his going. He just lets it grow more. Uh, Johnny Goudreau? 
patchy at best. Freddie Hamilton. Definitely. Uh, Curtis Lazar. Uh, probably patchy. Sean Monahan. Patchy at best. <laughs> if nothing else, we could cut some hair off Monahan's head and stick it onto Goudreau's chin. Yeah, that'd look a little weird. <laughs> there's a there's a job for the trainer. Uh, Matt Stajan. He's Definitely, already got a beard, yeah. but I think I think he could be like the you know the big bushy bushman beard this year. Yeah. Uh, what about Matthew Kachuk? I think he could. Chris Versteeg. Probably. He's a season, yeah. Season playoff guy, right? He's used to the beards. Yep. Um, Matt Bartkowski. It, doesn't he already? He's got one, yeah, but I don't know if he's going to... I think his beard's about as long as it's going to get. Yeah. I just get the sense he's not one of these big beard dudes. Yeah. Um, Brody, I think, I'll have a, a good playoff beard. England, I think, I'll have a good playoff beard. Geo, we, well, we've seen playoff beard from him. Uh, Hamilton? Uh, for sure. His is blonde, so to get it noticeable, it's going to have to grow like big and thick. Yeah. You need like a Mike Commodore-style exactly bushy beard michael stone i don't think he's gonna have much of a playoff beard dennis weidman who knows we're probably not gonna see much of him um brian elliott i think if elliott wants to he could get a pretty massive beard going yep and uh chad johnson i'm not sure chad john there's kind of your 10 year old looking guy johnson's the baby face guy on this team yeah I but, think he might have a hard time. I mean, he's got a little bit of hair already, but I don't think he's going to be able to grow much more. Yeah. Um, so, with you know, with those being decided, one of the questions every year is who's that, I don't want to say the best beard, but who becomes that playoff hero? Who becomes the guy that when we look back, we remember in that playoffs? And the 04 run for a lot of people is Jelena. In the last run, it was Furland. Who emerges, do you think, is the playoff hero this year? I'm going to go with number 19. He is the prototypical dirtbag playoff guy. Matthew I think Kachuk. that if the Flames I think if the Flames are going to get through the Ducks and I think it'll probably be about a six game series, but I think if the Flames get through the Ducks, you're right, Kachuk's going to be the one that's got to be the aggressor on our side. Yeah. And honestly, I know this is going to sound weird, but I I truly believe that the most important player for the Flames organization moving forward in terms of building a cup contending team is actually Matthew Kachuk. And he is that guy that is just so much of a dick <laughs> on the ice and knows exactly what buttons to press and in just the right fashion that... Like, if you look at successful teams, they always have that guy. And I firmly believe that if he is on his game, it might not even be this year, but, like, moving forward, I think he is going to be, like, the Flames MVP in the playoffs, period, because he can just do it all and well, i think it, his role will be a lot like his old man i don't think he's ever necessarily gonna be your best player your you know your no. top score every year but he's definitely one of those pieces that you say this guy has to be here in our lineup for us to be successful yeah and he just needs to play his game as effectively as he can and like he might not couldn't be the best scorer on the team like if the flames say they go on an extended run i don't expect them to be leading the team in scoring it's just that so much of the work that helps a team succeed is the type of game that he plays. And I'm hoping that he has a good season this year, but it, hey, he's 19. Like, it, you know, it's not likely that he's going to be awesome right from the get go, but he's more of a playoff built player than pretty much anybody in the organization. So. I'm hoping that he does have that good stretch, and if I had to pick one player, it would be him. Who do you think is this year's... Oh, sorry, I'll make my prediction first. I think I think you're right. I think Chuck's probably going to emerge as the hero, the guy that we see sort of lead this team through the playoffs, um, the guy who we really remember. I think that's definitely reasonable. I also think it could be Dougie Hamilton. Yeah, I think... I could agree I'd with that. I'd put either one there. I don't think Hamilton's necessarily going to be the top 
score or anything, but I think you might see Hamilton be the one who is, you know, constantly taking the puck from the Ducks, the guy who's constantly getting in their way, the guy who's making it hard for them to score. And sometimes the defense don't get credit for that kind of stuff, but I think that Hamilton may be that guy who, you know, we look back and go, yeah, Hamilton's the reason we made it to round two. Now I have a quick question for you. Sure. If the Flames win against Anaheim, Mm Mm-hmm. Do you think we win against the winner of the Edmonton San Jose series? I've been thinking about this. I think that I think we can beat Edmonton at that point because I think Edmonton's going to get themselves beat up in round one. I'm not sure a beat up Calgary Flames team, which is what you're going to have if you end up beating the Ducks. I'm not sure a beat up Calgary Flames team can beat the San Jose Sharks. Oh. What do you think? I'm actually going to flip on you. And, like, if the Flames are really beat up after the Anaheim series, if they win, I, I'm i not sure if they can contain McDavid. But, but McDavid will be beat up by that point, too. Not as beat up as we are, but there's one guy there. Yeah. It just depends on McDavid, really. Like, if you remove him from the Edmonton Oilers lineup, they're done. Eh, period. So... You know, like, if he gets hurt at all, like, the Oilers' season's over. I think the two teams that are going to beat up on us would be Anaheim and San Jose. And I think if we get beat up by Anaheim and then we have to go against San Jose, I'm not sure we're going to have the manpower to beat up both teams. Yeah. I I think it would be a tough series either way, but I think the Flames could find themselves in the conference finals if... They get through Anaheim, but yeah, I, I just it's think that we, gonna be a I tough... think we have a deep enough roster that we can, if we play Edmonton, yeah, we got to worry about McDavid, but I think we have a deep enough roster we can put more pucks in the other net than McDavid can put in our net. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to. Can you get more pucks in the other net quicker than McDavid can get them in yours? And I also think we have a physical enough back end that we may be able to to contain McDavid. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing here is we've seen. This iteration of the Calgary Flames play both Anaheim and San Jose. We've not seen this iteration of the Calgary Flames play the Edmonton Oilers. No. So it's an interesting comparison there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I don't, I don't know. That's just my thought. Is I don't I don't know that we at that point could take on. And San Jose is also a better playoff built team. I think that they're going to have better stamina going into the into the second round. I agree. So that's that's my thought, is we'd beat Edmonton, not San Jose. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you, though, Matt, is if you remember the last playoff series, Michael Furland was really the AHL call-up who really made a name for himself, for himself in that series. He was the guy that got under the skin. He was the guy who really, I think, I don't want to say cemented an NHL spot because of his play there, but the fans fell in love with him. Um, you know, he he really showed us what he can do. Who do you think that guy is, that dark horse, if you will, going into this round, who could be the next Furlan, the guy that we're not anticipating is going to do much and comes out and may blow us away? Well, if the Flames, say they come back from Cal- or Anaheim down 2 nothing, I'd throw Jonathan Gillies in that. Ain't going to hurt. Really? And that would be my pick. I think that he could pull... Uh, handful of games out of his hat and be that difference maker if given the opportunity i don't know what a handful of games i think that's all we get in this series i know but Two, I, maybe if you're I lucky i think that he could be it, uh, realistically the flames don't have any unsung players in their lineup this year like you know like maybe lazar but my guess is christopher steeg We've seen Versteeg heat up lately. He hasn't been great, but I think his playoff, I don't know, veteranness isn't a word, but his, I guess, playoff experience, I think is going to come into play. I think we're going to see Versteeg maybe keeping a cooler head than a lot of the younger guys. And I think you might see him almost like the Jelena of 04, being that, you know, that key piece that is doing things we're not expecting him to do. I can agree with that. And I think he may emerge and get a job because of it next year here in Calgary. Yep. Now, uh, one more question. Uh, sure. Let's go quickly through the other series. Uh, Washington-Toronto, who wins? 
Washington. How many games? Five. I would actually agree with you there. Uh, I just think Washington's Washington is such a powerhouse this year and Toronto is looking better, but they're, they're not going to be Washington. No. Uh, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Pittsburgh. I I'm going to agree. I'm going to say six games. Yeah, I'll say six too. I think Columbus can, I think Columbus, Pittsburgh is going to underestimate Columbus. Columbus will get one or two against them. Yeah. Uh, New York, Montreal, Montreal. I'm going to go with the Rangers on that one. I think there's a battle of the goalies. Yeah, I think uh, I think the Rangers are slightly better overall. And I'm not really a fan of Montreal other than Price. So I think the Rangers have a better blue line. I think the Canadians have a better forward core. And it's just going to be a matter of who does their job better. It's like a defensive team versus an offensive team in football. Yeah. Ottawa, Boston. Boston. I'm going to go with Ottawa. So Really? Yeah. I, I just think Boston has more playoff-ready guys. Yeah, so do I. But I think that Ottawa is the better team. So. Yeah, I don't know. We just we haven't seen enough from me out of Ottawa to prove to me that they can do it in seven. Yeah. Uh, Chicago versus Nashville. Chicago. I'm going to take the Hawks in six. I, I don't think there's going to be any big upsets this year. Yeah. Uh Minnesota, Nash, uh, St. Louis. I think Minnesota in five. Yeah, I think Minnesota will take this. I think it's going to go six or seven. Yeah. Uh, Edmonton, San Jose. I want to say San Jose as a fan, but if there's going to be an upset, it's going to be this one. I think McDavid can shoulder the Oilers to at least one round. I think he can shoulder them all the way to the finals, but I think McD- the McDavid show can roll on for one round. So I'll take Edmonton. Yeah, I was going to say Oilers in six. There's um, got to be an upset somewhere, and that's the only one I can see happening. Well, it wouldn't really be an upset because Edmonton actually finished ahead of the Sharks. They but. finished ahead, but I mean, if you look at the rosters and the way the teams are built, these Sharks should go further than round one. Yeah. And Calgary versus Anaheim. Do I put my fan hat on or my objective reporter hat on? Put the objective reporter. I think Anaheim in six. I was going to say Anaheim in five. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not sure the Flames are quite ready yet, but we'll see. No, and if nothing else, is a good playoff experience. Yeah. Well, Matt, um, with that, why don't we look ahead at the next week and look back at our prediction game for the season? Sure. So we're done with the regular season. Uh, the last week of Flames hockey, the Flames had six possible points in the table. And they got how many of those six? Two. Two, and you'd guess two. But you thought that they would beat L.A., which they did. So you got uh, two points on the on the season or yeah. on the week. Yay. I guessed four points. I thought we'd beat San Jose and L.A. Um, so I got zero. So our final score, mm. nine for me, five for you. Yay. You really, you're like the Flames. You've come out early or you come out late. You kind of faltered at the beginning of the season. Yeah. And now we get into looking at the playoffs. And we have three games over the next week. We'll probably record our next show on the 18th after the first home game, um, which is right after Easter weekend. And until then, there's three games. There's two of them in the Honda Center, one here in Calgary. And you know what? I don't think we're going to have probably more than two games here in Calgary for Lucky. So if you want to go to these games, they're great fun. Go see our friends at Tick Ticks. Download their app on your mobile device. Buy some tickets and get into that sea of red. You want to be there. It's so much fun. Um, and then make sure you experience the red mile after. So Matt, three games, um, April 13th, April 15th, and April 17th. Prediction? <sighs> I'm going to go with my fan hat here. I, I'm i going to say that they're going to win game one and three. So you think they win the first game in the Honda Center? Yeah, and the third one. Because I'm going to go with the optimistic side of things and say that Flames are going to take it in six. So that will be my route for the first three games will be one and three for us. All right, I'm going to... I'm not going to say I'm going to be pessimistic. I'm just going to say I'm going to be more realistic. I think game one, the Flames don't do well. I think the Flames are going to sort of have to adjust to Anaheim's style of play. I think there's going to be a lot of penalties. I think it's going to be the last game we saw. I think game two, the Flames play better. 
but Anaheim still beats them, and I think the Flames will win their first game back at the Dome on the 17th. Yeah, so basically like a replay of 2015. Pretty much, yeah. I think we drop the first two in the Honda Center, and we will win the first game in the Dome. Uh. I just think... I still think that Anaheim is the... I mean, and I don't think there's any doubt that Anaheim is better built for the playoffs. Yeah. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. And realistically, they've won the division five years in a row. So, yeah, they should know what they're doing. And as Daryl Sutter used to say, you know, you can't win Lord Stanley's mug if you don't at least make it to the dance or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. But, um, you know, he used to always say that you just got to make the playoffs. Anything can happen when you make the playoffs. Yeah, and, and realistically, the Flames need to just go out and do their best and like nobody's expecting them to win the series anaheim's fan base for sure is expecting them to walk all over us i'm sure the ducks themselves are expecting to walk all over us and realistically when you've lost 25 games in a row in the one building you're not and 21 of 27 in a row uh it's not a good matchup for Calgary. So th- this is going to be the test for the Flames so that way they get experience moving forward. As they're as emerging like into being a contender, they're going to have to figure out a way to beat this team cuz realistically over the next 3-4 years Anaheim's going to be the team that's going to be getting in their way. Like yeah, Edmonton's going to be there, but Anaheim's always going to be the one that's going to be giving them a hard time. So I think Anaheim's need... always going to be that thorn that if you can't beat Anaheim, you can't win the cup. Yeah, and until they can beat Anaheim in a playoff series, they're not going to do anything. And they have to figure out a way. Because the Flames can match up against the Oilers fairly well. They can match up against the Sharks fairly well. Same with Nashville, same with St. Louis, same with Minnesota, even same as Chicago. The only team that seems to have all can play in multiple different ways is Anaheim. And Calgary is trying to build themselves in very much that same way where if they you need to play physical, you can play physical. If you need to be fast, you can be fast. If you can need to play a finesse game, you can. And uh, Calgary is not as good as Anaheim in any of those three categories, but that's how they will have to get to be as good as Anaheim or better than Anaheim is to be able to find a way to actually prevail over a team that can do all of those things. How many games do you think we might see that are going to go to um, more than three periods? If I had to guess two. You think we'll see two of them that are going to take us to overtime? Yeah. Do you think we see any more than three overtimes? Probably not. In any one game? Probably not. Here's a question that just came into us via Twitter, and I've heard somebody say this earlier this week as well. Do the Flames call Bowling up to give him some uh, some physical strength? He wouldn't be my choice. I, I'd bring up Hathaway. I think if you're at the point of calling Bowling up, you're screwed either way. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, if, if we're that depleted, if we're getting that many guys knocked around that we need to bring Bowling back up, you're probably done. Yeah, like we're like nine or ten players down at that point. (laughs) Yeah, I think that even toughness-wise, there's other guys who are good enough that we could bring up. I mean, you're not going to out-bully the... If you're bringing them up because you think you're going to out-bully the Ducks, you're not going to out-bully the Ducks. No, you'd be better off bringing up Jankowski or Klimchuk at that point and try to beat them a different way. And Matt, I also decided to take a look at the NHL rulebook today. Rule 73 is refusal to start play. 73.2 and point three uh, do tell us that there is a method in which you can forfeit a game. So hopefully the Flames won't go that way. But, you know, there's there's almost going to be said of, you know what, let's rest up. Let's drop the first two to a one nothing score, and we'll see you back in the Dome. Coward. <laughs> <laughs> am I a coward or am I saving my assets? Coward. <laughs> You can't, it's in the you, can't book. you can't learn anything if you don't go through the experience. And even if that means you get a black eye along the way, you gotta take it. We'll still go to the experience. We'll still play them one game in Anaheim for game three. Right. Or game three there, I think. Yeah, but. no. You gotta take your licks. And you know, if the Flames end up losing the series, so be it. But 
you know. Well, I think that's a great thing. There's no expectation right now. I mean, this is a team that at one point looked like they were going to be drafting potentially first overall. So, you know, there's no expectation right now. What happens, happens. Yeah. Like, if they lose the series in four games, oh, well. You know, like, it, that sucks, but it happens. Yeah. It was if, they, and... if they win the series, hey, that's awesome. Who are we going to play in round two? So, it, you know, you just take each game and just enjoy it, simply, and see how it goes. And win or lose, the Flames are doing a good thing by being there. They're getting experience, so that way next year they can make adjustments and build towards eventually winning a Stanley Cup. They could fluke out and get the right matchups along the way and win the Cup this year. Doubtful. But hey, I don't think anybody predicted 04 happening. So anything can happen. It's just got to see how they play. And right, if they get question. in their own way, then that it won't be a long playoff run last question for you before we break for the week in 04 where you could find us in the dome chilling with jerome this year you'll find us in the dome chilling with who uh that's uh hmm. nobody's name rides with dome this year no you'll find us in the dome chilling with moose <laughs> just because it sounds humorous yeah he's got the best nickname of the team this year too so all right, well, Matt, enjoy the first three games, and we'll talk to you again on the 18th. Thanks for listening, everybody, and go Flames, go. Go Flames, go. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat, and to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. <laughs>